people who know me he went on, will think that what I write about the governess cart and my mother and the flowers and so on is written merely because I know in here he scratched his head a little harder to show himself that he referred to his brain, that that's the sort of thing one ought to write about. They'll think I'm a sort of dingy Romaine Roland, hopelessly trying to pretend that I feel the emotions and have the great spiritual experiences, which the really important people do feel and have. And perhaps they'll be right. Perhaps the life of Gumbrel will be as manifestly an heir's arts as the life of Beethoven. On the other hand, they may be astonished to find that it's the genuine article. We shall see. Gumbrel nodded his head slowly, while he transferred two pennies from his right-hand trouser pocket to his left-hand trouser pocket. He was somewhat distressed to find that these coppers had been trespassing among the silver. Silver was for the right hand copper for the left. It was one of the laws which it was extremely unlucky to infringe. I have a premonition he went on, that one of these days I may become a saint. An unsuccessful flickering sort of saint, like a candle beginning to go out. As for love, m yes, m yes. And as for the people I have met, I shall point out that I have known most of the eminent men in Europe, and that I have said of all of them what I said after my first love affair, is that all? Did you really say that about your first love affair? asked Mrs. Viviash, who had woken up again. Didn't you? No, I said, this is all, everything, the universe. In love, it's either all or nothing at all. She shut her eyes and almost immediately went to sleep again. Gumbrel continued his lullaby soliloquy. This charming little book. The Scotsman. This farrago of obscenity, slander and false psychology. Darlington Echo. Mr. Gumbrel's first cousin is Saint Francis Xavier, his second cousin is the Earl of Rochester, his third cousin is the Man of Feeling, his fourth cousin is David Hume. Court Journal Gumbrel was already tired of this joke. When I consider how my light is spent he went on, when I consider. Herr Jesu as Fräulein Nimenirin used to exclaim at the critical moment. Consider, dear cow, consider. This is not the time of year for grass to grow. Consider, dear cow, consider, consider. He got up from his chair and tiptoed across the room to the writing table. An Indian dagger lay next to the blotting pad, Mrs. Viviash used it as a paper knife. Gumbrel picked it up, executed several passes with it. Thumb on the blade he said, and strike upwards. On guard. Lunge. To the hilt it penetrates. Ponyard at the tip. He ran the blade between his fingers, caress by the time it reaches the hilt. Z, zip. He put down the knife and stopping for a moment to make a grimace at himself in the mirror over the mantelpiece, he went back to his chair. At seven o'clock Mrs. Viviash woke up. She shook her head to feel if the pain were still rolling about loose inside her skull. I really believe I'm all right, she said. She jumped up. Come on, she cried. I feel ready for anything. 
and I feel like so much food for worms, said Gumbril. Still, Vergiamataza Pyana il generoso ama. He hummed the drinking song out of Robert the Devil, and to that ingenuously jolly melody they left the house. Their taxi that evening cost them several pounds. They made the man drive back and forth, like a shuttle, from one end of London to the other. Every time they passed through Piccadilly Circus Mrs. Vivius leant out of the window to look at the sky signs dancing their unceasing St. Vitus's dance above the monument to the Earl of Shaftesbury. How I adore them, she said the first time they passed them. Those wheels that whiz round till the sparks fly out from under them, that rushing motor, and that lovely bottle of port filling the glass and then disappearing and reappearing and filling it again. Too lovely. Too revolting Gumbrel corrected her. These things are the epileptic symbol of all that's most bestial and idiotic in contemporary life. Look at those beastly things and then look at that. He pointed to the county fire office on the northern side of the circus. There stands decency, dignity, beauty, repose. And their flickers, their gibbous and twitches. What? Restlessness, distraction, refusal to think, anything for an unquiet life, what a delicious pedant you are. She turned away from the window, put her hands on his shoulders and looked at him. Too exquisitely ridiculous. And she kissed him. You won't force me to change my opinion. Gumbrel smiled at her. Epicimuov, I stick to my guns like Galileo. They move and they're horrible. They're me, said Mrs. Vivius emphatically. Those things are me. They drove first to Lipit's muse. Under the Piranesian arch. The clothes lines looped from window to window across the street might have been those ropes which form so essential and so mysterious a part of the furniture of the prisons. The place smelt, the children were shouting, the hyena-like laughter of the flappers reverberated between the close-set walls. All Gumbrel's sense of social responsibility was aroused in a moment. Shut up in his room all day, Lipit had been writing, writing his whole life, all his ideas and ideals, all for Myra. The pile of scribbled sheets grew higher and higher. Towards evening he made an end, he had written all that he wanted to write. He ate the remains of yesterday's loaf of bread and drank some water, for he realized suddenly that he had been fasting the whole day. Then he composed himself to think, he stretched himself out on the brink of the well and looked down into the eyeless darkness. He still had his service revolver. Taking it out of the drawer in which it was kept, he loaded it, he laid it on the packing case which served him as a table at his bed's head, and stretched himself out on the bed. He lay quite still, his muscles all relaxed, hardly breathing. He imagined himself dead. Derision. There was still the plunge into the well. He picked up the pistol looked down the barrel. Black and deep as the well. The muzzle against his forehead was a cold mouth. There was nothing new to be thought about death. There was not even the possibility of a new thought. Only the old thoughts, 
the horrible old questions returned. The cold mouth to his forehead, his finger pressing on the trigger. Already he would be falling, falling. And the annihilating crash would be the same as the faraway sound of death at the bottom of the well. And after that, in the silence. The old question was still the same. After that, he would lie bleeding. The flies would drink his blood as though it were red honey. In the end the people would come and fetch him away, and the coroner's jury would look at him in the mortuary and pronounce him temporarily insane. Then he would be buried in a black hole, would be buried and decay. And meanwhile, would there be anything else? There was nothing new to be thought or asked. And there was still no answer. In the room it began to grow dark, colors vanished, forms ran together. The easel and Myra's portrait were now a single black silhouette against the window. Near and far were fused, become one and continuous in the darkness, became a part of the darkness. Outside the window the pale twilight grew more somber. The children shouted shrilly, playing their games under the green gas lamps. The mirthless, ferocious laughter of young girls mocked and invited. Lipit stretched out his hand and fingered the pistol. Down below, at his door, he heard a sharp knocking. He lifted his head and listened, caught the sound of two voices, a man's and a woman's. Myra's voice he recognized at once, the other, he supposed, was Gumbrel's. Hideous to think that people actually live in places like this Gumbrel was saying. Look at those children. It ought to be punishable by law to produce children in this street. They always take me for the Pied Piper said Mrs. Viviash. Lipit got up and crept to the window. He could hear all they said. I wonder if Lipit's in. I don't see any sign of a light. But he has heavy curtains said Mrs. Viviash and I know for a fact that he always composes his poetry in the dark. He may be composing poetry. Gumbrel laughed. Knock again said Mrs. Viviash. Poets are always absorbed, you know. And Casimir's always the poet. Il Poeta, capital P. Like D'Annunzio in the Italian papers said Gumbrel. Did you know that D'Annunzio has books printed on Macintosh for his bath? He rapped again at the door. I saw it in the Corriere della Sera the other day at the club. He reads the little flowers of Saint Francis by preference in his bath. And he has a fountain pen with waterproof ink in the soap dish, so that he can add a few fioretti of his own whenever he feels like it. We might suggest that to Casimir. Lipit stood with folded arms by the window, listening. How lightly they threw his life, his heart, from hand to hand, as though it were a ball and they were playing a game. He thought suddenly of all the times he had spoken lightly and maliciously of other people. His own person had always seemed, on those occasions, sacred. One knew in theory very well that others spoke of one contemptuously, as one spoke of them. In practice, it was hard to believe. Poor Casimir! said Mrs. Viviash. I'm afraid his show was a failure. 
I know it was said Gumbrel. Complete and absolute. I told my tame capitalist that he ought to employ Lipit for our advertisements. He'd be excellent for those. And it would mean some genuine money in his pocket. But the worst of it is said Mrs. Viviash, that he'll only feel insulted by the suggestion. She looked up at the window. I don't know why she went on, this house looks most horribly dead. I hope nothing's happened to poor Casimir. I have a most disagreeable feeling that it may have. Ah, this famous feminine intuition laughed Gumbrel. He knocked again. I can't help feeling that he may be lying there dead, or delirious or something. And I can't help feeling that he must have gone out to dinner. We shall have to give him up, I'm afraid. It's a pity. He's so good with Mer Captain. Like Bear and Mastiff. Or rather, like Bear and Poodle, Bear and King Charles's Spaniel or whatever those little dogs are that you see ladies in 18th century French engravings taking to bed with them. Let's go. Just knock once again said Mrs. Viviash. He might really be preoccupied, or asleep, or ill. Gumbrel knocked. Now listen. Hush. They were silent. The children still went on hallooing in the distance. There was a great clop-clopping of horses' feet as a van was backed into a stable door nearby. Lipit stood motionless, his arms still crossed, his chin on his breast. The seconds passed. Not a sound said Gumbrel. He must have gone out. I suppose so said Mrs. Viviash. Come on, then. We'll go and look for Mer Captain. He heard their steps in the street below, heard the slamming of the taxi door. The engine was started up. Loud on the first gear, less loud on the second, whisperingly on the third, it moved away, gathering speed. The noise of it was merged with the general noise of the town. They were gone. Lipit walked slowly back to his bed. He wished suddenly that he had gone down to answer the last knock. These voices, at the well's edge he had turned to listen to them, at the well's extreme verge. He lay quite still in the darkness and it seemed to him at last that he had floated away from the earth, that he was alone, no longer in a narrow dark room, but in an illimitable darkness outside and beyond. His mind grew calmer, he began to think of himself, of all that he had known, remotely, as though from a great way off. Adorable lights, said Mrs. Viviash as they drove once more through Piccadilly Circus. Gumbrel said nothing. He had said all that he had to say last time. And there's another exclaimed Mrs. Viviash, as they passed, near Burlington House, a fountain of Sandermans Port. If only they had an automatic jazz band attached to the same mechanism. She said regretfully. The green park remained solitary and remote under the moon. Wasted on us, said Gumbrel, as they passed. One should be happily in love to enjoy a summer night under the trees. He wondered where Emily could be now. They sat in silence, the cab drove on. Mr. Mer Captain it seemed, had left London. 
his housekeeper had a long story to tell. A regular Bolshevik had come yesterday, pushing in. And she had heard him shouting at Mr. Merkaptan in his own room. And then, luckily, a lady had come and the Bolshevik had gone away again. And this morning Mr. Merkaptan had decided, quite sudden-like, to go away for two or three days. And it wouldn't surprise her at all if it had something to do with that horrible Bolshevik fellow. Though of course Master Paster hadn't said anything about it. Still, as she'd known him when he was so high and seen him grow up like, she thought she could say she knew him well enough to guess why he did things. It was only brutally that they contrived to tear themselves away. Secure, meanwhile, behind a whole troop of butlers and footmen, Mr. Merkaptan was dining comfortably at Oxhanger with the most faithful of his friends and admirers, Mrs. Spiegel. It was to Mrs. Spiegel that he had dedicated his coruscating little loves of the Pash items, for Mrs. Spiegel it was who had suggested, casually one day at luncheon, that the human race ought to be classified in two main species the Pash items, and those whose skin, like her own, like Mr. Merkaptan's and a few others, was fine and responsive as Mr. Merkaptan himself put it, to all caresses, including those of pure reason. Mr. Merkaptan had taken the casual hint and had developed it, richly. The barbarous Pash items he divided up into a number of subspecies, Stetocephali, Aephali, Theolitas, Industrious Judeoangsi, Busy, Compact and Hard as Dung Beetles, Peabodies, Russians and so on. It was all very witty and delicately savage. Mr. Merkaptan had a standing invitation at Oxhanger. With dangerous pash items like Lipit ranging loose about the town, he thought it best to avail himself of it. Mrs. Spiegel, he knew, would be delighted to see him. And indeed she was. He arrived just at lunch time. Mrs. Spiegel and Maisie Furlonger were already at the fish. Merkaptan. Mrs. Spiegel's soul seemed to be in the name. Sit down she went on, cooing as she talked, like a ring dove. There seemed to be singing in every word she spoke. She pointed to a chair next to hers. Enury and just in time to tell us all about en your lesbian experiences. And Merkaptan, giving vent to his fully orchestrated laugh, squeal and roar together, had sat down and, speaking in French partly, he nodded towards the butler and the footman, a cause des valets and partly because the language lent itself more deliciously to this kind of confidences, he had begun there and then, interrupted and spurred on by the cooing of Mrs. Spiegel and the happy shrieks of Maisie Furlonger, to recount at length and with all the wit in the world his experience among the Isles of Greece. How delicious it was! he said to himself, to be with really civilized people. In this happy house it seemed scarcely possible to believe that such a thing as a pash item existed. But Lipid still lay, face upwards, on his bed, floating, it seemed to himself, far out into the dark emptinesses between the stars. From those distant abstract spaces he seemed to be looking impersonally down upon his own body stretched out by the brink of the hideous well, 
to be looking back over his own history. Everything, even his own unhappiness, seemed very small and beautiful, every frightful convulsion had become no more than a ripple, and only the fine musical ghost of sound came up to him from all the shouting. We have no luck, said Gumbrill, as they climbed once more into the cab. I'm not sure, said Mrs. Viviash, that we haven't really had a great deal. Did you genuinely want very much to see Mer Captain? Not in the least, said Gumbrill. But do you genuinely want to see me? Mrs. Viviash drew the corners of her mouth down into a painful smile and did not answer. Aren't we going to pass through Piccadilly Circus again? she asked. I should like to see the lights again. They give one temporarily the illusion of being cheerful. No, no, said Gumbrill, we are going straight to Victoria. We couldn't tell the driver to. Certainly not. Ah, well said Mrs. Viviash. Perhaps one's better without stimulants. I remember when I was very young, when I first began to go about at all, how proud I was of having discovered champagne. It seemed to me wonderful to get rather tipsy. Something to be exceedingly proud of. And, at the same time, how much I really disliked wine. Loathed the taste of it. Sometimes, when Calliope and I used to dine quietly together, tete-a-tete, -tete, with no awful men about, and no appearances to keep up. We used to treat ourselves to the luxury of a large lemon squash, or even raspberry syrup and soda. Ah, I wish I could recapture the deliciousness of raspberry syrup. Coleman was at home. After a brief delay he appeared himself at the door. He was wearing pyjamas, and his face was covered with red-brown smears. The tips of his beard were clotted with the same dried pigment. What have you been doing to yourself? asked Mrs. Viviash. Merely washing in the blood of the lamb Coleman answered, smiling, and his eyes sparkling blue fire, like an electric machine. The door on the opposite side of the little vestibule was open. Looking over Coleman's shoulder, Gumbrill could see through the opening a brightly lighted room and, in the middle of it, like a large rectangular island, a wide divan. Reclining on the divan an odalisk by Ingers, but slimmer, more serpentine, more like a lithe pink length of bore, presented her back. That big brown mole on the right shoulder was surely familiar. But when, startled by the loudness of the voices behind her, the Udalisk turned round, to see in a horribly embarrassing instant that the Cossack had left the door open and that people could look in, were looking in, indeed, the slanting eyes beneath their heavy white lids, the fine aquiline nose, the wide, full-lipped mouth, though they presented themselves for only the fraction of a second, were still more recognizable and familiar. For only the fraction of a second did the Udalisk reveal herself definitely as rosy. Then a hand pulled feverishly at the counterpane, the section of buff-colored ball wriggled and rolled, and, in a moment, where a nude lisk had been, lay only a long packet under a white sheet, like a jockey with a fractured skull when they carry him from the course. Well, really. Gumbrill felt positively indignant, not jealous, but astonished and righteously indignant. 
Well, when you've finished bathing said Mrs. Viviash, I hope you'll come and have dinner with us. Coleman was standing between her and the father door, Mrs. Viviash had seen nothing in the room beyond the vestibule. I'm busy said Coleman. So I see. Gumbrel spoke as sarcastically as he could. Do you see, asked Coleman, and looked round. So you do. He stepped back and closed the door. It's Theodore's last dinner pleaded Mrs. Viviash. Not even if it were his last supper said Coleman, enchanted to have been given the opportunity to blaspheme a little. Is he going to be crucified? Or what? Merely going abroad said Gumbrel. He has a broken heart Mrs. Viviash explained. Ah the genuine platonic tozers. Coleman uttered his artificial demon's laugh. That's just about it said Gumbrel, grimly. Relieved by the shutting of the door from her immediate embarrassment, Rosie threw back a corner of the counterpane and extruded her head, one arm and the shoulder with the mole on it. She looked about her opening her slanting eyes as wide as she could. She listened with parted lips to the voices that came, muffled now, through the door. It seemed to her as though she were waking up, as though now, for the first time, she were hearing that shattering laugh, were looking now for the first time on these blank, white walls and the one lovely and horrifying picture. Where was she? What did it all mean? Rosie put her hand to her forehead, tried to think. Her thinking was always a series of pictures, one after another the pictures swam up before her eyes, melted again in an instant. Her mother taking off her pince-nez to wipe them, and at once her eyes were tremulous and vague and helpless. You should always let the gentleman get over the style first, she said, and put on her glasses again. Behind the glasses her eyes immediately became clear, piercing, steady and efficient. Rather formidable eyes. They had seen Rosie getting over the style in front of Willie Hoskines, and there was too much leg. James reading at his desk, his heavy, round head propped on his hand. She came up behind him and threw her arms round his neck. Very gently, and without turning his eyes from the page, he undid her embrace and, with a little push that was no more than a hint, an implication, signified that he didn't want her. She had gone to her pink room, and cried. Another time James shook his head and smiled patiently under his moustache. You'll never learn, he said. She had gone to her room and cried that time too. Another time they were lying in bed together, in the pink bed, only you couldn't see it was pink because there was no light. They were lying very quietly. Warm and happy and remote she felt. Sometimes as it were the physical memory of pleasure plucked at her nerves, making her start, making her suddenly shiver. James was breathing as though he were asleep. All at once he stirred. He patted her shoulder two or three times in a kindly and businesslike way. I know what that means she said, when you pat me like that. And she patted him, pat pat pat, very quickly. It means you're going to bed. How do you know, he asked. Do you think I don't know you after all this time?
I know that pat by heart. And suddenly all her warm, quiet happiness evaporated, it was all gone. I'm only a machine for going to bed with she said. That's all I am for you. She felt she would like to cry. But James only laughed and said, nonsense, and pulled his arm clumsily from underneath her. You go to sleep he said, and kissed her on the forehead. Then he got out of bed, and she heard him bumping clumsily about in the darkness. Damn, he said once. Then he found the door, opened, and was gone. She thought of those long stories she used to make up when she went shopping. The fastidious lady, the poets, all the adventures. Toto's hands were wonderful. She saw, she heard Mr. Mercaptain reading his essay. Poor father, reading aloud from the Hibbert Journal. And now the car sack covered with blood. He, too, might read aloud from the Hibbert journal, only backwards, so to speak. She had a bruise on her arm. You think there's nothing inherently wrong and disgusting in it, he had asked. There is, I tell you. He had laughed and kissed her and stripped off her clothes and caressed her. And she had cried, she had struggled, she had tried to turn away, and in the end she had been overcome by a pleasure more piercing and agonizing than anything she had ever felt before. And all the time Coleman had hung over her, with his blood-stained beard, smiling into her face, and whispering, horrible, horrible, infamous and shameful. She lay in a kind of stupor. Then, suddenly there had been that ringing. The car sack had left her. And now she was awake again, and it was horrible, it was shameful. She shuddered, she jumped out of bed and began as quickly as she could to put on her clothes. Really, really, won't you come? Mrs. Viviash was insisting. She was not used to people saying no when she asked, when she insisted. She didn't like it. No Coleman shook his head. You may be having the last supper. But I have a date here with the Magdalene. Oh, a woman said Viviash. But why didn't you say so before? Well, as I'd left the door open said Coleman, I thought it was unnecessary. Fie said Mrs. Viviash. I find this very repulsive. Let's go away. She plucked Gumbrel by the sleeve. Goodbye said Coleman, politely. He shut the door after them and turned back across the little hall. What? Not thinking of going, he exclaimed, as he came in. Rosie was sitting down on the edge of the bed pulling on her shoes. Go away she said. You disgust me. But that's splendid Coleman declared. That's all as it should be all as I intended. He sat down beside her on the divan. Really he said, admiringly, what exquisite legs. Rosie would have given anything in the world to be back again in Blockham Gardens. Even if James did live in his books all the time. Anything in the world. This time said Mrs. Viviash. We simply must go through Piccadilly Circus. It'll only be about two miles farther. Well, that isn't much. 
Gumbrel leaned out and gave the word to the driver. And besides, I like driving about like this said Mrs. Viviash. I like driving for driving sake. It's like the last ride together. Dear Theodore. She laid her hand on his. Thank you said Gumbrel, and kissed it. The little cab buzzed along down the empty mall. They were silent. Through the thick air one could see the brightest of the stars. It was one of those evenings when men feel that truth, goodness and beauty are one. In the morning, when they commit their discovery to paper, when others read it written there, it looks wholly ridiculous. It was one of those evenings when love is once more invented for the first time. That, too, seems a little ridiculous, sometimes, in the morning. Here are the lights again said Mrs. Viviash. Hop, twitch, flick, yes, genuinely an illusion of jollity, Theodore. Genuinely. Gumbrel stopped the cab. It's after half past eight he said. At this rate we shall never get anything to eat. Wait a minute. He ran into a pen rods, and came back in a moment with a packet of smoked salmon sandwiches, a bottle of white wine and a glass. We have a long way to go he explained as he got into the taxi. They ate their sandwiches, they drank their wine. The taxi drove on and on. This is positively exhilarating said Mrs. Viviash, as they turned into the Edgware Road. Polished by the wheels and shining like an old and precious bronze, the road stretched before them, reflecting the lamps. It had the inviting air of a road which goes on forever. They used to have such good peep shows in this street Gumbrel tenderly remembered, little back shops where you paid tuppence to see the genuine mermaid, which turned out to be a stuffed walrus, and the tattooed lady, and the dwarf, and the living statuary, which one always hoped, as a boy was really going to be rather naked and thrilling, but which was always the most pathetic of unemployed barmaids, dressed in the thickest of pink jiga. Do you think there'd be any of those now? asked Mrs. Viviash. Gumbrel shook his head. They've moved on with the march of civilization. But where? He spread out his hands interrogatively. I don't know which direction civilization marches, whether north towards Kilburn and Golders Green, or over the river to the Elephant, to Clapham and Sydenham and all those other mysterious places. But, in any case, high rents have marched up here, there are no more genuine mermaids in the Edgware Road. What stories we shall be able to tell our children? Do you think we shall ever have any? Mrs. Viviash asked. One can never tell. I should have thought one could said Mrs. Viviash. Children, that would be the most desperate experiment of all. The most desperate and perhaps the only one having any chance of being successful. History recorded cases. On the other hand, it recorded other cases that proved the opposite. She had often thought of this experiment. There were so many obvious reasons for not making it. But someday, perhaps, she always put it off, like that. The cab had turned off the main road into quieter and darker streets. 
Where are we now? asked Mrs. Viviash. Penetrating into Maida Vale. We shall soon be there. Poor old Shewater. He laughed. Other people in love were always absurd. Shall we find him in, I wonder? It would be fun to see Shewater again. She liked to hear him talking, learnedly, and like a child. But when the child is six feet high and three feet wide and two feet thick, when it tries to plunge head first into your life, then, really, no. But what did you want with me? he had asked. Just to look at you she answered. Just to look. That was all. Music hall, not boudoir. Here we are. Gumbrel got out and rang the second floor bell. The door was opened by an impertinent looking little maid. Mr. Shewaters at the lavatory, she said, in answer to Gumbrel's question. Laboratory, he suggested. At the hospital. That made it clear. And is Mrs. Shewater at home? He asked maliciously. The little maid shook her head. I expected her, but she didn't come back to dinner. Would you mind giving her a message when she does come in? said Gumbrel. Tell her that Mr. Toto was very sorry he hadn't time to speak to her when he saw her this evening in Pimlico. Mr. Who? Mr. Toto. Mr. Toto is sorry he hadn't the time to speak to Mrs. Shewater when he saw her in Pimlico this evening. Very well, sir. You won't forget, said Gumbrel. No, I won't forget. He went back to the cab and explained that they had drawn blank once more. I'm rather glad said Mrs. Viviash. If we ever did find anybody, it would mean the end of this last ride together feeling. And that would be sad. And it's a lovely night. And really, for the moment. I feel I can do without my lights. Suppose we just drove for a bit now. But Gumbrel would not allow that. We haven't had enough to eat yet he said, and he gave the cabman Gumbrel Sr.'s address. Gumbrel Sr. was sitting on his little iron balcony among the dried out pots that had once held geraniums smoking his pipe and looking earnestly out into the darkness in front of him. Clustered in the fourteen plane trees of the square, the starlings were already asleep. There was no sound but the rustling of the leaves. But sometimes, every hour or so, the birds would wake up. Something... Perhaps it might be a stronger gust of wind, perhaps some happy dream of worms, some nightmare of cats simultaneously dreamed by all the flock together, would suddenly rouse them. And then they would all start to talk at once, at the tops of their shrill voices, for perhaps half a minute. Then in an instant they all went to sleep again and there was once more no sound but the rustling of the shaken leaves. At these moments Mr. Gumbrel would lean forward, would strain his eyes and his ears in the hope of seeing, of hearing something, something significant, explanatory, satisfying. He never did, of course but that in no way diminished his happiness. Mr. Gumbrel received them on his balcony with courtesy. I was just thinking of going into work, he said. And now you come and give me a good excuse for sitting out here a little longer. 
I'm delighted. Gumbrel Jr. went downstairs to see what he could find in the way of food. While he was gone, his father explained to Mrs. Viviash the secrets of the birds. Enthusiastically, his light floss of grey hair floating up and falling again about his head as he pointed and gesticulated, he told her, the great flocks assembled, goodness only knew where, they flew across the golden sky, detaching here a little troop, there a whole legion, they flew until at last all had found their appointed resting places and there were no more to fly. He made this nightly flight sound epical, as though it were a migration of peoples, a passage of armies. And it's my firm belief said Gumbrel Sr., adding notes to his epic, that they make use of some sort of telepathy, some kind of direct mind-to-mind -mind communication between themselves. You can't watch them without coming to that conclusion. A charming conclusion said Mrs. Viviash. It's a faculty Gumbrel Sr. went on. We all possess, I believe. All we animals. He made a gesture which included himself, Mrs. Viviash and the invisible birds among the plane trees. Why don't we use it more? You may well ask. For the simple reason, my dear young lady that half our existence is spent in dealing with things that have no mind, things with which it is impossible to hold telepathic communication. Hence the development of the five senses. I have eyes that preserve me from running into the lamp post, ears that warn me I'm in the neighborhood of Niagara. And having made these instruments very efficient, I use them even in holding converse with other beings having a mind. I let my telepathic faculty lie idle, preferring to employ an elaborate and cumbrous arrangement of symbols in order to make my thought known to you through your senses. In certain individuals, however, the faculty is naturally so well developed, like the musical, or the mathematical, or the chess-playing faculties in other people, that they cannot help entering into direct communication with other minds, whether they want to or not. If we knew a good method of educating and drawing out the latent faculty, most of us could make ourselves moderately efficient telepaths just as most of us can make ourselves into moderate musicians, chess players and mathematicians. There would also be a few, no doubt, who could never communicate directly. Just as there are a few who cannot recognize Rule Britannia or Bach's Concerto in D minor for two violins, and a few who cannot comprehend the nature of an algebraical symbol. Look at the general development of the mathematical and musical faculties only within the last 200 years. By the 21st century, I believe, we shall all be telepaths. Meanwhile, these delightful birds have forestalled us. Not having the wit to invent a language or an expressive pantomime, they contrive to communicate such simple thoughts as they have, directly and instantaneously. They all go to sleep at once, wake at once, say the same thing at once, they turn all at once when they are flying. Without a leader, without a word of command. They do everything together, in complete unison. Sitting here in the evenings, I sometimes fancy I can feel their thoughts striking against my own. It has happened to me once or twice, 
that I have known a second before it actually happened, that the birds were going to wake up and begin their half minute of chatter in the dark. Wait. Hush. Gumbrel Sr. threw back his head, pressed his hand over his mouth, as though by commanding silence on himself he could command it on the whole world. I believe they're going to wake now. I feel it. He was silent. Mrs. Viviash looked towards the dark trees and listened. A full minute passed. Then the old gentleman burst out happily laughing. Completely wrong, he said. They've never been more soundly asleep. Mrs. Viviash laughed too. Perhaps they all changed their minds, just as they were waking up she suggested. Gumbrel Jr. reappeared, glasses clinked as he walked and there was a little rattle of crockery. He was carrying a tray. Cold beef he said, and salad and a bit of a cold apple pie. It might be worse. They drew up chairs to Gumbrel Sr.'s work table, and there, among the letters and the unpaid bills and the sketchy elevations of archaeological palaces, they ate the beef and the apple pie and drank the one and nine penny vin or dinner of the house. Gumbrel Sr., who had already supped, looked on at them from the balcony. Did I tell you said Gumbrel Jr., that we saw Mr. Porteous's son the other evening, very drunk? Gumbrel Sr. threw up his hands. If you knew the calamities that young imbecile has been the cause of. What's he done? Gambled away I don't know how much borrowed money. And poor Porteous can't afford anything, even now. Mr. Gumbrel shook his head and clutched and combed his beard. It's a fearful blow, but of course... Porteous is very steadfast and serene and... There. Gumbrel Sr. interrupted himself, holding up his hand. Listen. In the fourteen plain trees the starlings had suddenly woken up. There was a wild outburst, like a stormy sitting in the Italian parliament. Then all was silent. Gumbrel Sr. listened, enchanted. His face, as he turned back towards the light, revealed itself all smiles. His hair seemed to have blown loose of its own accord, from within, so to speak, he pushed it into place. You heard them, he asked Mrs. Viviash. What can they have to say to one another? I wonder, at this time of night. And did you feel they were going to wake up? Mrs. Viviash inquired. No, said Gumbrel Sr. with candor. When we've finished Gumbrel Jr. spoke with his mouth full, you must show Myra your model of London. She'd adore it, except that it has no electric sky signs. His father looked all of a sudden very much embarrassed. I don't think it would interest Mrs. Viviash much, he said. Oh, yes it would. Really, she declared. Well, as a matter of fact it isn't here. Gumbrel Sr. pulled with fury at his beard. Not here. But what's happened to it? Gumbrel Sr. wouldn't explain. He just ignored his son's question and began to talk once more about the Starlings. Later on, however, when Gumbrel and Mrs. Viviash were preparing to go, 
the old man drew him apart into a corner and began to whisper the explanation. I didn't want to blare it about in front of strangers he said, as though it were a question of the housemaid's illegitimate baby or a repair to the water closet. But the fact is, I've sold it. The Victoria and Albert had wind that I was making it, they've been wanting it all the time. And I've let them have it. But why? Gumbrel Jr. asked in a tone of astonishment. He knew with what a paternal affection, no, more than paternal, for he was sure that his father was more wholeheartedly attached to his models than his son, with what pride he regarded these children of his spirit. Gumbrel Sr. sighed. It's all that young imbecile he said. What young imbecile? Porteous's son, of course. You see, poor Porteous has had to sell his library, among other things. You don't know what that means to him. All these precious books. And collected at the price of such hardships. I thought I'd like to buy a few of the best ones back for him. They gave me quite a good price at the museum. He came out of his corner and hurried across the room to help Mrs. Viviash with her cloak. Allow me, allow me he said. Slowly and pensively Gumbrel Jr. followed him. Beyond good and evil. Below good and evil. The name of Earwig. The tubby pony trotted. The wild columbines suspended, among the shadows of the hazel copse, hooked spurs, helmets of aerial purple. The twelfth sonata of Mozart was insecticide, no earwigs could crawl through that music. Emily's breasts were firm and pointed and she had slept at last without a tremor. In the starlight, good, true and beautiful became one. Write the discovery in books, in books quos, in the morning, leisure muscacants. They descended the stairs. The cab was waiting outside. The last ride again said Mrs. Viviash. Golgotha Hospital, Southwark said Gumbrel to the driver and followed her into the cab. Drive, drive, drive repeated Mrs. Viviash. I like your father, Theodore. One of these days he'll fly away with the birds. And how nice it is of those starlings to wake themselves up like that in the middle of the night, merely to amuse him. Considering how unpleasant it is to be woken in the night. Where are we going? We're going to look at Shewater in his laboratory. Is that a long way away? Immensely said Gumbrel. Thank God for that Mrs. Viviash piously and expiringly breathed. Chapter XXII She Water sat on his stationary bicycle, pedaling unceasingly like a man in a nightmare. The pedals were geared to a little wheel under the saddle and the rim of the wheel rubbed, as it revolved against a brake, carefully adjusted to make the work of the pedaler hard but not impossibly hard. From a pipe which came up through the floor issued a little jet of water which played on the brake and kept it cool. But no jet of water played on she water. It was his business to get hot. He did get hot. From time to time his dog-faced young friend, Lansing, came and looked through the window of the experimenting chamber to see how he was getting on. Inside that little wooden house, 
which might have reminded Lansing, if he had had a literary turn of mind, of the box in which Gulliver left Brobdingnag. The scenes of intimate life were the same every time he looked in. Shewater was always at his post on the saddle of the nightmare bicycle, pedaling, pedaling. The water trickled over the brake. And she water sweated. Great drops of sweat came oozing out from under his hair, ran down over his forehead, hung beaded on his eyebrows, ran into his eyes, down his nose, along his cheeks, fell like raindrops. His thick bull neck was wet, his whole naked body, his arms and legs streamed and shone. The sweat poured off him and was caught as it rained down in a waterproof sheet, to trickle down its sloping folds into a large glass receptacle which stood under a hole in the center of the sheet at the focal point where all its slopes converged. The automatically controlled heating apparatus in the basement kept the temperature in the box high and steady. Peering through the damp dimmed panes of the window, Lansing noticed with satisfaction that the mercury stood unchangingly at 27.5 centigrade. The ventilators at the side and top of the box were open, she water had air enough. Another time, Lansing reflected. They'd make the box airtight and see the effect of a little carbon dioxide poisoning on top of excessive sweating. It might be very interesting, but today they were concerned with sweating only. After seeing that the thermometer was steady, that the ventilators were properly open, the water was still trickling over the break, Lansing would tap at the window. And she water, who kept his eyes fixed straight before him, as he pedaled slowly and unremittingly along his nightmare road, would turn his head at the sound. All right. Lansing's lips moved and his eyebrows went up inquiringly. She water would nod his big, round head, and the sweat drops suspended on his eyebrows and his moustache, would fall like little liquid fruits shaken suddenly by the wind. Good and Lansing would go back to his thick German book under the reading lamp at the other end of the laboratory. Constant as the thermometer she water pedaled steadily and slowly on. With a few brief halts for food and rest. He had been pedaling ever since lunchtime. At eleven he would go to bed on a shakedown in the laboratory and at nine tomorrow morning he would re-enter the box and start pedaling again. He would go on all tomorrow and the day after, and after that, as long as he could stand it. One, two, three, four. Pedal, pedal. Pedal. He must have travelled the equivalent of sixty or seventy miles this afternoon. He would be getting on for Swindon. He would be nearly at Portsmouth. He would be past Cambridge, past Oxford. He would be nearly at Harwich, pedalling through the green and golden valleys where Constable used to paint. He would be at Winchester by the bright stream. He would have ridden through the beech woods of Arundel out into the sea. In any case he was far away, he was escaping. And Mrs. Viviash followed, walking swayingly along on feet that seemed to tread between two abysses, at her leisure. Pedal, pedal. The hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. Formidably, calmly, her eyes regarded. The lids cut off an arc of those pale circles. 
When she smiled, it was a crucifixion. The coils of her hair were copper serpents. Her small gestures loosened enormous fragments of the universe and at the faint dying sound of her voice they had fallen in ruins about him. His world was no longer safe, it had ceased to stand on its foundations. Mrs. Vivius walked among his ruins and did not even notice them. He must build up again. Pedal, pedal. He was not merely escaping, he was working a building machine. It must be built with proportion, with proportion, the old man had said. The old man appeared in the middle of the nightmare road in front of him, clutching his beard. Proportion, proportion. There were first a lot of dirty rocks lying about. Then there was St. Paul's. These bits of his life had to be built up proportionably. There was work. And there was talk about work and ideas. And there were men who could talk about work and ideas. But so far as he had been concerned that was about all they could do. He would have to find out what else they did. It was interesting. And he would have to find out what other men did, men who couldn't talk about work and not much about ideas. They had as good kidneys as anyone else. And then there were women. On the nightmare road he remained stationary. The pedals went round and round under his driving feet, the sweat ran off him. He was escaping, and yet he was also drawing nearer. He would have to draw nearer. Woman, what have I to do with you? Not enough, too much. Not enough, he was building her in, a great pillar next to the pillar of work. Too much, he was escaping. If he had not caged himself here in this hot box, he would have run out after her, to throw himself, all in fragments, all dissipated and useless, in front of her. And she wanted none of him. But perhaps it would be worse, perhaps it would be far, far worse if she did. The old man stood in the road before him clutching his beard, crying out, proportion, proportion. He trod and trod at his building machine, working up the pieces of his life, steadily, unremittingly working them into a proportionable whole, into a dome that should hang, light, spacious and high, as though by a miracle, on the empty air. He trod and trod, escaping, mile after mile into fatigue, into wisdom. He was at Dover now, pedaling across the channel. He was crossing a dividing gulf and there would be safety on the other side, the cliffs of Dover were already behind him. He turned his head as though to look back at them, the drops of sweat were shaken from his eyebrows from the shaggy fringes of his moustache. He turned his head from the blank wooden wall in front of him over his left shoulder. A face was looking through the observation window behind him, a woman's face. It was the face of Mrs. Vivius. She water uttered a cry and at once turned back again. He redoubled his pedalling. One, two, three, four, furiously he rushed along the nightmare road. She was haunting him now in hallucinations. She was pursuing and she was gaining on him. Will, wisdom, resolution and understanding were of no avail, then. But there was always fatigue. 
The sweat poured down his face, streamed down the indented runnel of his spine, along the seam at the meeting place of the ribs. His loincloth was wringing wet. The drops pattered continuously on the waterproof sheet. His calves and the muscles of his thighs ached with pedaling. One, two, three, four, he trod round a hundred times with either foot. After that he ventured to turn his head once more. He was relieved, and at the same time he was disappointed, to see that there was now no face at the window. He had exorcised the hallucination. He settled down to a more leisurely pedaling. In the annex of the laboratory the animals devoted to the service of physiology were woken by the sudden opening of the door, the sudden eruption of light. The albino guinea pigs peered through the meshes of their hutch and their red eyes were like the real lights of bicycles. The pregnant she-rabbits lolloped out and shook their ears and pointed their tremulous noses towards the door. The cock into which she water had engrafted an ovary came out, not knowing whether to crow or cluck. When he's with hens Lansing explained to his visitors, he thinks he's a cock. When he's with a cock, he's convinced he's a pullet. The rats who were being fed on milk from a London dairy came tumbling from their nest with an anxious hungry squeaking. They were getting thinner and thinner every day, in a few days they would be dead. But the old rat, whose diet was greater milk from the country, hardly took the trouble to move. He was as fat and sleek as a brown furry fruit, ripe to bursting. No skim and chalky water, no dried dung and tubercle bacilli for him. He was in clover. Next week, however, the fates were plotting to give him diabetes artificially. In their glass pagoda the little black axolotls crawled, the heraldry of Mexico, among a scanty herbage. The beetles, who had had their heads cut off and replaced by the heads of other beetles, darted uncertainly about some obeying their heads, some their genital organs. A fifteen-year-old monkey, rejuvenated by the Steinach process, was discovered by the light of Lansing's electric torch, shaking the bars that separated him from the green-furred, bald-rumped, bearded young beauty in the next cage. He was gnashing his teeth with thwarted passion. Lansing expounded to the visitors all the secrets. The vast, unbelievable, fantastic world opened out as he spoke. There were tropics, there were cold seas busy with living beings, there were forests full of horrible trees, silence and darkness. There were ferments and infinitesimal poisons floating in the air. There were leviathans suckling their young, there were flies and worms, there were men, living in cities, thinking, knowing good and evil. And all were changing continuously, moment by moment, and each remained all the time itself by virtue of some unimaginable enchantment. They were all alive and on the other side of the courtyard beyond the shed in which the animals slept or uneasily stirred, in the huge hospital that went up sheer like a windowed cliff into the air, men and women were ceasing to be themselves, or were struggling to remain themselves. They were dying, they were struggling to live. The other windows looked onto the river. The lights of London Bridge were on the right, of Blackfriars to the left. On the opposite shore, 
St. Paul's floated up as though self-supported in the moonlight. Like time the river flowed, silent and black. Gumbrel and Mrs. Vivius leaned their elbows on the sill and looked out. Like time the river flowed, stanchlessly, as though from a wound in the world's side. For a long time they were silent. They looked out, without speaking, across the flow of time, at the stars, at the human symbol hanging miraculously in the moonlight. Lansing had gone back to his German book, he had no time to waste looking out of windows. Tomorrow said Gumbrel at last, meditatively. Tomorrow Mrs. Vivius interrupted him, will be as awful as today. She breathed it like a truth from beyond the grave prematurely revealed, expiringly from her deathbed within. Come, come protested Gumbrel. In his hot box she water sweated and pedalled. He was across the channel now, he felt himself safe. Still he trod on, he would be at a me ends by midnight if he went on at this rate. He was escaping, he had escaped. He was building up his strong light dome of life. Proportion, cried the old man, proportion. And it hung there, proportioned and beautiful in the dark, confused horror of his desires, solid and strong and durable among his broken thoughts. Time flowed darkly past. And now said Mrs. Vivius, straightening herself up, and giving herself a little shake. Now we'll drive to Hampstead and have a look at Piers Cotton. Printed by Morrison and Gibb Limited, Edinburgh Transcribers notes silently corrected typographical errors and variations in spelling. Anachronistic, non-standard, and uncertain spellings retained as printed. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook antic hey asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by US copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the foundation and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by US copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start Full license the full Project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works, 
by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1.0 By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Work, you indicate that you have read, understand. Agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark forward slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the Foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. 
The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.E Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.E.1 1 1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.E.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder. The work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.E.1 through 1.E.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.E.8 or 1.E.9. 1.E.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder for use and distribution,